Would you stand with me this morning? We want to just worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the worthy Lamb of God. Worthy is your name, Lord. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy. Let's sing that out. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, precious Lamb of God, worthy your name crown him with many crowns the lamb upon his throne hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but it's own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing. Who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that dead may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, who power a scepter sways from pole to pole that wars may cease and all be prayer and praise his reign shall know no end and round his pierced feet fair flowers of paradise extend their fragrance ever sweet crown him the lord of love Behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou wast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Worthy, you are 
worthy, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy, worthy, you are worthy, King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you, holy Lord, holy, you are holy, you are holy, kings, Lord of lords, you are holy, holy, you are holy, king of kings. Lord of lords, I worship you. Jesus, you are Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are Jesus. Jesus, you are Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Jesus, Lamb of God, worship Precious Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Father, we recognize that you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our worship with all that is within us, and we are not worthy to be in your presence. We know that we have no right to be here in and of ourselves, that nothing we could have ever done could have turned your head toward us and accepted us in and of ourselves because we are sinners. And in your presence we recognize our sinfulness. And we also recognize, as a result of our sinfulness, the great grace that was bestowed upon us in the way that you gave your Son to be our Savior. And if we are worthy of, at all, and we are, it's because of Jesus Christ, who has cleansed us from our sin, who has torn down the wall that separates us from you. Jesus, who makes it possible for us to nurture a relationship with you. Jesus, who is indeed the centerpiece of your gospel that has transformed our lives and in his name we come today gladly joyfully reverently humbly in the awareness that had it not been for your son our savior we would not have any reason to be here today and so we are grateful kind father that you allow us to worship you in the name of our savior jesus christ in whose name i pray Amen. You may be seated. Our guest preacher today is presently pastor of First Baptist Church, Tupelo, Mississippi. I've known him ever since we were in college together, which uh, dates us back in the late modern age of history, and uh, have watched him grow through the years from uh, uh, working in uh, pastorates in, here in the, on the mainland, and then to see God work in a tremendous way as he was pastor of the First Baptist Church, Grand Cayman. And uh, we all heard about what God was doing out there in that part of the world. God called him back to the mainland, and he has continued to be characterized one great passion, and that is to allow people to have an encounter with God through Jesus Christ. He's a preacher who embraces text and, he and embraces people and tries to intersect them. He's a preacher who knows the power of the Holy Spirit in preaching and in teaching and in worship. 
and we're going to see what I'm talking about today as he comes to preach in just a moment. Indeed, he's been a pastor for a long time. Back of that, he's been a dad. He's a dad. Back of that, he's a husband. Back of that, he's a growing believer who walks with God and who yearns for other people to know the Lord personally through Jesus Christ. And in just a moment, as we continue to worship, we're going to hear from him. His name is Dr. Randy Von Cannell. Right now, God will, uh, we will be led by the Lord's word as it's read, and then continue in worship, and then Dr. Von Cannell will preach. Good morning. We're in a season of preparation for revival meetings here on our campus. You know that, right? Campus uh, revival is scheduled for next week. But, you know, it seems to me the most important thing is not what happens next week in this place at this hour. It is what happens right now in our souls. Because if we will plead with God to awaken our souls, then perhaps there will be renewal, awakening, revival. We do that when we gather for worship. We do that when we hear from God's word. And we do that in prayer, which in its simplest form is a conversation with God. Have you ever had a conversation with someone when their words said one thing and their body language said something else? Well, I'm going to give you a chance to have a conversation with God with your body language now. Our prayer emphasis for the day is to set our hearts to seek the Lord. Our, our focus is to, to say we are turning our hearts toward Him. If that is your request, and you mean it, would you stand with me, please? God is speaking in his word, and I want you to use your best outside Southeastern Conference sporting event voice to read with me what he says. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hoped for. When you call on me, when you come and pray to me, I'll listen. When you come looking for me, you'll find me. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. If that is your plea that we'll not be disappointed, close our prayer with me by saying, We just heard a wonderful promise from the Bible. So don't get too comfortable sitting down. Because we're about to hear some more promises from the Lord's Word. Ministering the Word to one another. And singing this old hymn about standing on the promises. And I find it very hard to sing, sing that while you're sitting down. So let's stand as we minister the Word to one another. Ready? Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. God's promise in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lay not on to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. It's a great promise. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. 
Philippians 4 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Hebrews 13:5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I was young, and now I'm an, I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, or their children begging bread. Psalm 37, 20. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Amen. Are you hearing those promises? Are you letting them just sink into your soul this morning? The Bible is so full of promises, and God is faithful. Standing on the promises of Christ. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, my tower of refuge and strength. 
Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us see power and majesty. Praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing. Oh, nothing compares to the promise I have. Oh, nothing. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Thank you, Father, for the promises from your word. Thank you for being a faithful God, a loving God, a powerful God. Nothing's too hard for you. But thank you for being a merciful God. And thank you for the promises to your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm going to do something that I've wanted to do a long time. Don't get nervous, Dr. Smith. I'm going to go up in this choir loft. I'm going to share a little bit of a testimony. I think it was this chair. It was 1977. It was the fall semester. And I was in the seminarians. It was my first semester here. And uh, I came up this little ramp back here, and I said to my buddy, I said, you know who's preaching today? He said, no, who? He said, Dr. Baker James Coffin. So, I said, we know when he preaches, half the school's going to wind up in Africa. Executive director of the Foreign Mission Board of that time. So I told him in a little jest, I said, I'm going to wrap my feet around this chair leg. I'm sure it was a different chair. And when he starts preaching, I'm going to hold on. And we laughed. And he started preaching and I slipped my foot around that leg. And when it was over, I think half the student body was at the altar. But I didn't go. <laughs> I hung on. And yet, when the invitation ended, he did something he shouldn't have done. He said, I just feel led of the Spirit. Just sing one more stanza. And if you're just willing to pray, and say, God, if you want me in missions, I'm willing. Well, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> of course I'm willing to pray. And it was the beginning of standing on some precious promises for me when I walked down to this altar, and just a few months later, without a doubt, I saw the Lord's hand moving me toward missions, a journeyman program that would ultimately result in, yes, that experience of being the first pastor of the First Baptist Church of Grand Cayman. My life's never been the same since. The Lord led. That's a special moment as I remember that chair. I preached here a few years ago, but I didn't do that. You know, sometimes when you make statements, you say things that can get you in trouble. Bunny Martin, who's a friend of mine, who's the founder of uh, Reaching America's Youth, Ray, was with us in the Cayman Islands. Uh, I don't know if you know Bunny, but he's the yo-yo champion of the world. <laughs> he really is, too. He, he struck two matches sticking out of my ears, crossing the yo-yos in front of my head. <laughs> it's amazing what you'll do as a preacher pastor sometimes. <laughs> but he, he, he's the one that said laughter is the lotion for the sunburns of life. And he's really a funny guy, but he tells a story about this little boy with his grandmother in a Walmart-type store, shopping along there, and the grandmother tosses into the buggy a, a, a pair of pantyhose. And he's a little fellow just learning to read, and he picks that package up, and he starts spelling Q-U-E. 
E E N S I clean size, he said. And he said, Nana, you're the same size as Mommy and Daddy's mattress. <laughs> and he said it with some volume that others heard. You know, sometimes what we say can get us in trouble. When I say, yes, Lord, it, it, it led me into some trouble. It led me into some difficult choices and some tough days that would ultimately result in the glory of God being revealed in my life. And this morning, I want to read with you from Acts chapter 6, if you take your Bibles, and we're going to find a young man here that said something that got him in trouble. Acts chapter 6. I'm, I'm going to read uh, portions of this larger passage that will extend all the way through the end of chapter 7. You know the story well. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? I lived in this British area long enough to know you stand in the presence of royalty. You're not standing in my presence. You're standing in the presence of the King of Kings who speaks to us today. And the word is beginning with verse 5, picking up on the decision of the early church led by the Spirit to call out men who were full of the Holy Spirit. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. Thank you, you may be seated. Just a few years ago, while serving with Global Outreach International, I was an interim pastor, leaving one interim, and I moved into the interim at First Baptist Church of Columbus, Mississippi. Due to some events in my family, uh, I needed to get closer to home. This church was closer to Tupelo, and, and I started preaching. I accepted the interim role, and that very week, First Baptist Tupelo, search committee contacted me. Ah. But from the beginning of that conversation through a several meetings, I just knew this is of the Lord. Well, what do I do about Columbus? <laughs> I had just accepted, oh no, I told the interim committee chair, I said, this is what's happening. He said, well, Randy, you've got to do what God wants you to do, gracious man. So about six weeks later, I'm meeting to tell this Columbus crowd that I'm going to leave them and go to Tupelo, kind of rival cities anyway, that didn't help matters. Well, it just so happened of the Lord that the morning service, Father's Day, I'm preaching on, on a faithful man, and I gave all the men at the end of that service, as they came to the altar, I gave them a polished river rock, a rock of remembrance. It was a real moving service. But it was that night service that I would conclude my message and then announce this resignation. I didn't want to affect the worship of the day. So the night message, I, I had prepared this some time back, this sequence of messages. I was going to end the Father's Day by talking about a spirit-filled man. Acts chapter 6, chapter 7. And I was in the midst of preaching this last sermon, and I got to about the third point where we'll get today when Stephen is going to be stoned to death, and it dawned on me I'd given these guys the rocks to hit me with. <laughs> and I got a little tickled there. And I tried to pull it back. I ended the message. And then I looked at them and told them, you know, this is what I've got to do tonight. And they had a great laugh. And they were full of grace. And they didn't throw those rocks. Now, you don't have rocks today. You do have some textbooks probably. But I, I want to I bring a message that, that, that's probably not real popular in some circles. Yet I think it's so vital to us today. I, I don't think you'll throw rocks or books at me today. But if you live out and and experience what I'm saying today from God's Word, you might get in trouble with it, like Stephen did. There could be a few rocks, books, a few other things thrown at you along the way. Because I'm talking today about the marks of a Spirit-filled life. The marks of a Spirit-filled life. My dear mentor in faith, Major Ian Thomas, said of the early believers, and this is a story about these early believers, he said of them, they were incorrigibly happy, 
utterly unafraid, and nearly always in trouble. Why? This winsome bunch, such daring courage, it just seemed like they were forever getting in trouble. The early movements of later great persecutions are taking place here. Why? Because these believers were living out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, having Christ who lived in them, living through them, and just as a world would respond to Jesus with the crucifixion, so Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, would meet a hostile crowd. Oh, but don't stop there. Don't be like the disciples before the cross who kept missing the point about resurrection when he talked about going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying. Because they did walk filled with the Spirit, they were able to experience the glory and the power of his resurrected life in them. Stephen is a good example for us. I want us to look here, just briefly, at the marks of a Spirit-filled life. First of all, a Spirit-filled life is a Spirit-controlled life. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The New Living Translation says, Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Paul, writing of the normal Christian life, a life of Holy Spirit fullness, said in Romans, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. The first mark of a Spirit-filled believer, and, and again, actually, the desired norm, it's really not something that should be different. It's just the life, the Christian life, the norm of every child of God is that he or she, that we are Spirit-led, we're Spirit-controlled, we're filled with the Spirit of God. Stephen was chosen because it was an evident testimony of his life that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And the mark of a Spirit-filled believer is that he is led or controlled by the Spirit. The people around him knew this guy is led by the Spirit. Now, that shouldn't be strange to us. Jesus himself didn't decide as a strategy choice to go into the wilderness as the best starting point in his goal of bearing a redemptive mission for his father. The Bible says, Mark recorded it, at once the Spirit sent him, drove him, shoved him, pushed him. The Spirit controlled his life and led him into the wilderness experience. Even Jesus was led of the Spirit. Now, with all respect to the powerful, Spirit-filled ministry of Rick Warren and the impact of his book, The Purpose Driven Life, I've led our church through it. It's awesome. I love the book. But with all respect to it, I have a, I have a real concern. You see, the need of our day is not to be purpose-driven, but Spirit-led. If we're full of the Holy Spirit, we will be controlled by the Spirit of the living God. And springing from that divine activity that is His alone in us, He will fulfill His purposes. That's why I love the book. Great. They're biblical. The purposes of God will be fulfilled through my life. But in the particulars of how that happens, the Spirit will lead me to do it and you to do it. I am concerned that the wonderful teachings of these kinds of books will be lost in a 21st century wave of human activity on God's behalf, taking the larger purposes of God and attempting to fulfill them with man's programs and man's plans rather than by God's power and God's control. Yes, God's leading us to worship. The Spirit's leading us to worship. He's leading us to fellowship, to become like Christ, to evangelize, to minister. But are we seeking the Holy Spirit's leadership for the particulars of what and how? We're to fulfill those purposes in our generation. An example is worship. Oh, I love this today. Spirit-filled worship. Led of the Spirit. It's obvious. But can we not engage in the latest of worship without being Spirit-led? My family went to New York City four years ago. We went to the Brooklyn Tabernacle. I, I just wanted to go. I've heard so much about that great church. I'd read the books of their pastor. Knew it to be a spirit dynamic church and so we went had to wait an hour and a half to get in the four o'clock service it was packed it was an awesome service but there were a few surprises to me that day 
First of all, there were no screens or PowerPoint. Imagine that. In a contemporary church, they didn't have screens. I was shocked. And all the men on the platform, they all had on suits. I, I just thought they were going to be casual. And then they sang some hymns. They did. No, they really did. And get this, Jim Cimbala, right in the middle of awesome worship, about 15 minutes of opening worship, we're just worshiping the Lord. He comes to the platform, leads in a prayer that takes us to the very throne of God. And when he comes out of his prayer, he makes some announcements and recognized guests. There's no way God can bless a church service when you do that. <laughs> and then he preached. Oh, me. He preached for 45 minutes with no visual aids. And not only that, you wouldn't believe the coarse language he used that day. He was preaching about the blessings of God being on your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. And whatever the Lord says is blessed is blessed. And no one or nothing can ever come between you and the blessings of God. And I needed to hear that. But I'll never forget what he said. He said, no hoodoo, no voodoo, and no doo-doo can come between you and the Lord. And I couldn't believe he said that. Oh, you don't, oh, it's a sensitive crowd. You don't say things like that if you're going to have a growing church. My point? My point is this. There's nothing wrong with contemporary worship trends or styles. I'm trying to use PowerPoint. And there's nothing intrinsically right about being traditional or blended or whatever. The issue really isn't the stuff. It's not the programs. It's not the styles. I, you know, I, I, I used to think myself on the cutting edge of things. Now, these days, I think I'm on the edge of being cut. You know, I'm, I'm sort of behind. But I love the new things that we're doing. So please don't hear me. I, I, that was awesome worship, and I've just been around. I, I've experienced worship all over the world. But I'm going to tell you, that really doesn't matter. What matters is what, what is the Holy Spirit led you to do. The Brooklyn Tab is known for two-hour Tuesday prayer meetings. They cry out to God. They're dependent on the Lord. They're being consumed by the Spirit. And the question for us is, are we Spirit-led and Spirit-controlled in whatever we're called to do? If He directs your congregation to sing Gregorian chants and you do it, you'll lead your association in baptisms and church growth. It's, are we led by the Spirit? We must be. Are we Spirit-filled? Are Southern Baptists being led of the Spirit? Let me ask this. If it's so, and it's going to come over harsh, but I love you. <laughs> I love our convention. If, if we're a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led generation, why is it that the vast majority of our seminary graduates in front of me and in all of our seminaries, why is the vast majority of our seminary graduates going to be called to where there are existing churches and numbers of believers rather than being led to the mission fields of the world where the vast majority of the unreached people live. I'm not even talking about overseas. What about the great cities of America? What about a place like Montana? I hear there's actually a meeting tonight and this week. You're, you're getting a chance to meet people from these different conventions. Go and listen to what the Spirit is saying and ask Him to show you and be controlled. Now, don't leave here. Uh, by the way, in Montana, I, I looked it up recently, a third of their churches are without pastors. How is it that we have so many around here and they're desperate there. Could it be that God's leading and we're not listening? Are we spirit-filled? Are we spirit-controlled? And, and I don't leave here and go on the Internet and see which one's closest to Yellowstone and sign up. <laughs> but do seek the Lord in His fullness and allow Him to send you where He would have you serve. The Bible says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, and I've underlined this in my text, for the work of to which I have called them. I want to be where God has called me. I do have a quote from Simbola. He said, I believe that if we could only hear better with spiritual ears today, we would hear a great cry from God, the Holy Spirit, over the roofs of our churches, seminaries, denominational headquarters, and mission agencies. And this is what he'd be saying. Listen to me. Hear me. I have a plan for you. I know how my work should be run. Stop everything for a while and listen to my voice. Are we spirit-filled? If we are, we'll be spirit-controlled. But alas, we have places to go and people to see. A five-minute prayer this morning, a three-person, ten-minute prayer this Wednesday night. 
Budgets to meet, buildings to build, Sunday morning preparations must take precedence. And we wonder why there's so much activity today and so little power. To be spirit-filled is to be spirit-controlled. It's also to be spirit-empowered. A spirit-filled life is a spirit-empowered life. Stephen was not only controlled by the spirit in my story that I just breezed through there, he's led into the very thick of things by the Holy Spirit. He is chosen, by the way. He didn't choose to be this prototype deacon. And nor does he choose to stand in front of this group called the freedmen, members of the synagogue of the freedmen. The Spirit of God is leading this Spirit-filled man, and now the Spirit gives him power because the Bible says opposition arose, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the Spirit by whom he spoke. I don't have time to really deal with all the phrases here, but throughout this text you'll find... These descriptive phrases, he's full of wisdom, he's full of faith, he's full of grace, he's full of power, he's full of everything that he needs for ministry and life. Why? Because he's full of the Holy Spirit. He's been given complete resources and power to do whatever God's called him to do. Now, some of you may be picturing Stephen as a man among men, naturally gifted, macho guy, leader among leaders, top of his class. And if you do... If you are, you're wrong. Well, I don't know. It doesn't really say anything about Stephen other than he's full of the Spirit and full of wisdom and full of power and full of grace and full of faith. All those phrases speaking to his eyes are on the Lord. His dependency is upon Christ. One of my favorite Old Testament passages is the eyes of the Lord. This is very... You can just see this happening. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Absolutely dependent upon Him. We have a personal family friend from Texas, Mr. Paul Meyer, a very wealthy gentleman. I remember he gave me a copy of his autobiography, I Inherited a Fortune. I knew his story. I said, as he handed it to him, I said, Mr. Paul, I think I know what this is going to be about because you... You didn't inherit a fortune. You were the son of migrant workers in the fields of Texas. What the book's about is how his parents gave him love and faith and a work ethic. And his book is basically about, because I was so blessed in my childhood with not having a lot but only having what really matters, I have been able today to achieve and do what God has done in my life. It's a really good book. And I've thought about that often. When I look back on my life, I'm blessed. I really mean that. I was blessed with godly parents who loved me, worked hard to provide for our family. But I need you to know something. I was also blessed that my dad only had an eighth grade education and worked all his life in a blue-collar job at the shipyard and later at the fertilizer plant in Pascagoula. I was blessed with a godly mother who loved us. She sewed underwear at the BBD factory for years until she got the job of her dreams. She became the church secretary at my home church. Of course, the first eight years, she did it without pay. I was blessed in high school. I was a great school. Fairly healthy body, fairly bright mind. I have to be careful saying things like that. I'm just, just an average guy, really. But I, I was also blessed because in my junior year, I realized that I couldn't give a book report in my high school honors English class because I had such a fear of public speaking. Mr. Bosworth, after trying several times to get me to give a book report, (laughs) he finally said, Randy, you just can't do it, can you? He gave up on me and let me do some extra writing assignments. I was blessed. Through the years, I've had blessings. Even recently, blessed with a precious family, my wife, Cindy, my son, Landon, my daughter, Randa, but also blessed with a four-year hiatus on the good things of life. Just a pit we fell in, personally. It culminated with the death of my son three years ago, killed in a car accident on his way back to LSU. No, I'm not being sadistic when I say I'm blessed. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being honest. You see, my blessings have meant that I've had to depend on the Holy Spirit. I love Ron Dunn's imagination about Jacob coming up out of the river Jabbok. You know, he's, he's been up all night. He's fought an angel. 
And right at the end, as the day's breaking, the angel hits him in the hip, knocks his hip out of joint, and now he's crippled. He's coming up out of the river, and his two boys come running because they've been looking for Dad all night. And they get up to Dad, and they say, Dad, what happened to you? And he said, I'm blessed. I've been blessed, boys. I've been blessed. You say, what do you mean? Well, I was called to the ministry in that junior year in high school. And I said, Lord, I can't even speak to my English class. He said, no, you can't, Randy. But I will speak through you if you'll trust me. I didn't have a preacher, pastor for a father or grandfather. If I had it, I know that would have been a blessing too. But I didn't. I had no one to help me get started or to offer me wise counsel. And I said, Lord, when he called me on that lonely jogging trail and came in to the pastorate ministry, I said, Lord, I can't do that. People know me as a music guy and youth guy. I can't do this. And he said, Randy, you can't. I never said you could, but I will. Just trust me. I learned early on in my life what my brothers and I used to kid each other about was really true. <laughs> I grew up with two other brothers and a little sister. We used to say, it was a term of affection now, we'd say, you ain't good for nothing. <laughs> I learned that's true. Now don't worry about my self-image. God loves me. I've learned I'm good for nothing because Jesus said that. He said, without me, you can do nothing. But with him, I can do all things through Christ, who's a source of my strength. So I've learned I'm good for nothing without him. And because I've learned that, I depend on him. I trust him for his spirit's fullness. In my son's death, I cried, oh God, I can't go on. But he said, yes, but I will be your strength. And you can. You see, I'm a cripple up here. I, I'm, I'm not even like Jacob. I can't even limp. I would fall over if it weren't for my dependency on the Lord today. And it's more than a theory or a conference point I'm trying to make. I'm wholly dependent on the Lord. Stephen stood in front of a hostile, educated crowd, and he knew something. He knew he couldn't do it. He had to depend upon the Spirit's fullness who had led him into this situation, and that dependency was his avenue to power because they couldn't resist the Spirit by which he spoke. He didn't say they couldn't resist Stephen. They couldn't resist the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit speaking. And finally, a Spirit-filled life. Well, it's actually the inevitable third point. If you're Spirit-controlled and Spirit-empowered because you're filled with His Holy Spirit, you will be, it's inevitable that you will be Spirit-consumed. Chapter 7. Verse 54, when they heard this, they were furious. What a love offering he got for that message. <laughs> they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, here it is, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What's going on? Filled with the Holy Spirit, his life was consumed by the Spirit. It was given over completely to whatever the Spirit would have him to do. And he died. And then he experienced the glory of God. When we're Spirit-controlled and Spirit-led, looking to Jesus only for what he wants, being led into situations and ministries that require us to depend upon him totally... And when we do that, we will find, as Stephen did, that our lives will be consumed by him for his glory. I want you to notice two things that happened when Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gave himself completely to the Lord. The first thing is, you see, he saw the glory of God. He saw Jesus. I, I believe that's literal. He saw the Lord. His chin was up. He saw him. More and more I live, my chin keeps getting pushed up. You keep looking up more. To him, he alone is your life and your strength and your hope. And he alone is glory. And Stephen saw the glory of God. Why don't we see the glory more in our churches today? 
could it be because we're not spirit-filled? And thus we're not spirit-consumed? He gave his life. And not only did he see the glory of God, he experienced the glory of God. Look what he did. He did what Jesus did, and he said what Jesus said. I know you picked that up. You knew it already as we were reading that. That's familiar. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the same thing Stephen said when he said, don't hold this against them. And Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. That's what Stephen said. Oh, I get it. He's being stoned to death, and he so loves the Lord that right before he dies, he wants to make sure that he gives a witness for Jesus. So there he is. He gets hit, and he goes, okay, I need to do something here for Jesus. And he says, Father, forgive them. I'm going to tell you, he didn't do that. He was not consciously trying to imitate Christ. He was not trying to give a witness for Jesus. What was happening, filled of the Holy Spirit, giving his life completely, what happened in that moment was that the Spirit of God spoke through him. And what do you think Jesus is going to say when Jesus speaks? He'll speak words that Jesus speaks. And those around him, and yes, Paul, who was holding the clothes, even Apostle Paul to be, would hear a witness of Jesus Christ. They would hear Jesus. Oh, sir, we would see Jesus was the cry in the New Testament. It still is. Not Stephen. The spirit that filled him was speaking through him, even in the moment of death. Are you spirit-filled? The scripture would say to us, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we allow the Spirit of God to control us, when we depend upon the Spirit to empower us, He will take over and consume us. And then and only then will we see the glory of God and bear witness to the life of Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Years ago, in that same sequence of time, coming out of this uh, choir loft experience, I heard a song kind of become a, a theme chorus for me. It goes like this. Will you be poured out as wine upon the altar for me? Will you be broken as bread to feed the hungry? Will you be so one with me that I can do as I will to make you life and light and love my will fulfill. Spirit of the living God, O oh, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, all fresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, all fresh on me. Oh, Lord, we ask now in this moment for you, by your Spirit who lives within us, we ask for you to fill us. Take control of every student's life here today and lead them. Lord, empower this student body and this faculty and staff. May that which happens here be only understood in terms of what, God, you're doing here. And Lord, knowing what this third point of prayer might mean, I pray that you would consume them for your glory and for a witness of Jesus in the world. Take their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.